Hello, welcome to First Chapter Friday. I'm Miss Andy, and this week I am going to read the first chapter of The First State of Being by Erin Entrada Kelly. This book is published by Green Willow Books. And here is what it says on the inside front flap. When a strange kid shows up in the courtyard at Fox Run Apartments, Michael isn't sure what to make of him. For one thing, he's dressed oddly. For another, he's acting weird like he's being followed. Michael isn't one for getting involved. He has enough to worry about just managing his own life. A new school, that annoying bully, BG, his not so secret crush on Gibby, his babysitter, as if he needs a babysitter, making his mom proud and preparing for Y2K. Y2K, as in the end of the world. Still, when Michael looks out his apartment window later that night and sees the kids sitting there in the darkness, this time holding one of the stray cats that Michael loves, something doesn't seem right. Something seems off. What if Michael is the only one who can make it right? Here is the first chapter of The First State of Being, which starts with the map, my favorite, <clears throat> of the Fox Run Apartments. Y2K, aka the Millennium Bug, or the Year 2000 Problem, refers to a worldwide panic that occurred on World as the calendar near January 1st, 2000. At the time, it was believed that computer systems would malfunction when internal program systems reset to the year 00. Some information technology experts warned that computers would not be able to distinguish the correct meaning of 00, resulting in widespread failure of vital infrastructures. This failure was expected to cause disruptions in air travel, banking, industry, electric, electric grids, phone systems, and other critical services necessary for daily living at the turn of the century. The Y2K scare was fueled by intense media coverage. Ultimately, however, there were very few disruptions and no disaster came to pass. That was an excerpt from the Spatial Teleportation Summary Book for the turn of the 21st century, 1980-2020, compiled by Maria Sabio, PhD, DST, Chief STS, University of Delaware, translated from original Eker Linton Code. The real chapter. Peaches, Michael Rosario thought. That's what we need. His mother loved peaches. If the world came to a standstill at midnight on January 1st, 2000, at least she would have two things she cherished, peaches and Michael. He gazed at the shelves of canned fruit in Super Saver. He pulled the can from the shelf. He looked left, then right, then left again. It was early, barely 7.30 in the morning. So the place was practically empty. It was the perfect time to go grocery shopping if you'd call it that. He slipped the peaches into the pocket of his windbreaker and felt them settle. He focused on the exit and headed in that direction. He pictured his mother huddled in the darkened hours of the new millennium, scooping a spoonful of sweet peaches into her mouth saying, you know what, Michael, you were right about Y2K. I should have listened. Sometimes 11 year old boys know exactly what to do. Only he wasn't even, he wasn't 11 anymore. As of today, he was 12 and they probably wouldn't need to open the canned goods right away. They'd have to eat everything from the refrigerator first before it all went bad. The exit was right in front of him. One or two steps and shoop, the automatic doors would slide open. Hey, Mikey Mike, he froze. It's Michael, not Mikey Mike, he instinctively said, though he didn't say it out loud because he recognized the voice and it belonged to 19-year-old Billy Gibson, who everyone called BG. If Michael were a different person, he might have kept walking or pretended he hadn't heard, but he couldn't, of course he couldn't, because everyone always heard BG. BG made sure of that. Michael turned. The peaches were so, so heavy. Michael felt the urge to sneeze. He was still getting over his stupid summer cold and his eyes watered. 
He didn't want to move. He didn't want to sneeze. He didn't want to do anything but disappear into the ether. DG was in the produce section wearing the standard Super Saver uniform, the kind Michael's mother had worn before she'd been fired. A cart of potatoes was parked next to him. What are you doing here so early in the morning? BG said. He picked up some potatoes and shoved them into place. Getting flowers for your mama, he snickered. Michael couldn't think of anything to say. Not a single word came to him. He pressed his right thumb into the center of his left palm. As soon as he looks at the potatoes again, I'll keep walking, he told himself. But BG didn't look at the potatoes. Instead, his gaze drifted over to Michael, over Michael's shoulder and landed on Jamar Prince, who was walking toward them holding three Butterfingers and a crumpled receipt. BG's expression turned serious. Jamar smiled faintly at Michael. Hey, I thought that was you, he said. You wanna walk back with me? Since when did Jamar Prince, who was 16 and in high school, want to walk anywhere with him? Since when did Billy Gibson work at the morning shift? Since when did either of them come anywhere near the Super Saver at 7.30 a.m.? Michael was here at precisely this time because he didn't want to see anyone. And now look. Um, Michael shifted from foot to foot. BG strode over holding a pale white potato which somewhat resembled the shape and color of his head. He narrowed his eyes at Jamar's candy bars. Did you pay for those? Jamar raised his chin. Yeah, I paid for them, he said, his voice sharp. What are you trying to say? Michael's body tensed. He felt like a blade of grass caught between two boulders. The exit was right there, a few steps away. If you paid for them, how come they're not, they're not in a bag, said BG. What do I need a bag for, Jamar said. And I don't need to steal candy bars from this raggedy store when I have money of my own. Jamar stepped closer to Michael and nudged his shoulder. Come on, let's walk back. Keep me company. Jamar headed toward the exit. Michael followed. You better not be stealing. My father's the manager, you know, BG called after them. He was talking to Jamar, of course, even though Michael was the one with a pocket full of peaches. Jamar called BG a name under his breath a two-syllable swear word, and he and as he and Michael went through the automatic doors and walked toward Fox Run Apartments, where they both lived. Michael wasn't one for swearing. He heard it all the time, of course, at school, around the complex, in movies, but for whatever reason, it made him feel squirmy, like he was doing something wrong, even though he wasn't doing anything. I wanted to make sure he wasn't giving you a hard time, Jamar said. He shoved two of the candy bars in his back pocket, ripped the third one open with his teeth, and split a piece of the torn wrapper onto the ground as they crossed the street. Michael wanted desperately to pick it up so he could throw it away properly, but he didn't want to look fussy. Jamar continued. Sometimes he messes with Darius. Darius was Jamar's younger brother. Michael wasn't sure how old he was, maybe eight or nine. Jamar had another brother, Elijah, who was going into seventh grade, just like Michael. They weren't friends, they weren't enemies, they weren't anything. Darius is quiet like you, Jamar said, his mouth full. Easy target for people. Except he didn't say people, he used the swear word again. They were now on the grounds of Fox Run Apartments and townhomes, the best community in Delaware. And Jamar veered left toward building A, while Michael veered right toward building J. See you around, said Jamar. Thanks, Michael said, but Jamar was already too far away to hear him. Michael didn't realize how tense he was until he saw the courtyard near his building. He took a deep breath and relaxed his shoulders. Everything looked as it should. Cars in their assigned parking spots, a stray cat, the one Michael had secretly named Tuxedo, slinking around the bushes, Mr. Mosley, the maintenance man, hefting a can of paint toward a vacant apartment. Hey, Mr. Mosley, Michael said. Mosley looked up. He had a brown weathered face, face smattered with wrinkles and folds from his forehead to his chin. But when he smiled like he was doing now, all the lines settled at the corners of his eyes. He was wearing his painting coveralls with fox run stitched on the pocket. Michael, Mosley said cheerfully. He set down the can of paint. Just the man I want to see. He pulled out his wallet, the one with the Philadelphia. Philadelphia Eagles logo emblazoned on the front and slipped a crisp $20 bill from it. Today is your big day, if I'm not mistaken. He waved the money in Michael's direction. 
You don't have to give me anything, Michael said. He sneezed and wiped his nose with the back of his hand, something he'd never do if his mama were here. But Mr. Mosley didn't care about such things. Well, yeah, I don't have to. There are only two things I have to do, pay taxes and die, Mosley said, one of his favorite expressions. Actually, make that three things, pay taxes, die, and paint three F. He towed the paint can. Eggshell white, it said. Same color as every apartment. But for now, I'm giving you 20 bucks. Michael wanted to take it, but he also didn't want to take it. It's one thing to shoplift because you don't have money. It's another thing to shoplift when you do. That's how Michael reconciled it anyway. Maybe I'll walk back to the Super Saver later and pay for the peaches properly, he thought, even though he knew he wouldn't. Thanks, Mr. Mosley, Michael said. He took the money. No problem. Besides, Mosley stopped mid-sentence. There was a kid, a teenager, several paces away, wandering toward them with an unusual expression on his face. He kept glancing over his shoulder like he was being followed. He looked, what, not afraid or panicked exactly, more like someone who had just committed a crime. Robbed a bank, perhaps, or stolen canned goods from the Super Saver? As he came closer, Michael realized how odd his clothes were. He was wearing a uniform of some kind, shirt and pants, white, but not white, eggshell maybe, like the paint, and his shoes were exactly the same eggshell color. Together, the outfit glinted strangely in the sun. Mosley stepped in, in front of Michael. Hey there, Mosley said, can I help you? The teenager seemed startled that Mosley was speaking to him, even though Mosley and Michael had been watching him the whole time, and vice versa. Hello, said the teenager. He looked like he could be half Filipino, like Michael. He stopped on the sidewalk a few steps in front of them and cleared his throat. What's up? You need help with something, Mosley said. No, I, I mean, yes, he paused. My name is Rich. It's a pleasure to meet you. Mosley ignored the introduction. You need help with something? Could you tell me the date, Ridge said. It's August 17th, Michael said quietly. Oh, thank you, Ridge said. He glanced over his shoulder. Of what year? Michael glanced at Mosley. What kind of person didn't know what year it was? It's 1999, Mosley replied. More a question than a statement. Ridge repeated the year under his breath. The expression on his face changed. Excitement or fear, Michael couldn't tell which. You live here at Fox Run, Mosley said. Never seen you before around here. Ridge didn't answer. He was chewing his bottom lip like he was trying to solve a complex math question. Did you hear me, kid? Mosley asked. Yes, I mean, yeah, Ridge replied, walking backward like he couldn't wait to get away from them. I do. I live right around here. He waved in a general direction that didn't mean anything. Then he turned on his heel. Thanks for your help. Peace out. Mosley and Michael watched him disappear behind building F. Well, that was weird, Mosley said. He picked up the paint can. Better keep an eye on that kid if we see him around again. He's up to something. He punched Michael playfully on the shoulder. Then again, we're all up to something in our way, right, Michael? Yeah, Michael said, thinking about his pocket full of peaches. We're all up to something. That's the end of the first chapter. This book is so good. I highly encourage you read it. It's a little bit of a time travel story, a little bit uh, historical fiction, a few other things in between. It's great. Pick it up from the Alameda Free Library and see you next time on First Chapter Friday.